Hey, I'm Steven, co-founder of Press Start Capital. I'll be your moderator for today. So we're super excited to have these big brains with us. You've got Luca Nets, the CEO of Pudgy Penguins, and Linus Chung, head of product at Magic Eden. Welcome, guys. Hey, hey GM. Happy to be here. Thanks for awesome. having us. Awesome, awesome. Uh, so why don't we just jump right into it? Um, we can hear your guys' personal story uh, straight from you guys. So Luca, if you don't mind starting us off. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Luca Nets. I'm 25 years old. I've been a serial entrepreneur for the last seven years. I uh, grew up all over the world with my mom, uh, bouncing around uh, house to house, uh, door to door. Uh, whoever let us stay, we uh, grew up in a pretty bad situation. I uh, dropped out of high school when I was uh, 15. I uh, got my first job at a tech startup called Ring Doorbell. Uh, I uh, found uh, internet marketing and became an e-commerce entrepreneur uh, at 18 years old. And I uh, have got some pretty big wins under my belt uh, since then. In 2020, I brought back a clothing brand called Von Dutch. Uh, in 2021, we uh, started and grew North America's fastest growing toy company, which is a company called Gel Blaster. Uh, we basically went from zero to $100 million in revenue uh, in just under two years. And uh, about 20 months ago, we bought Pudgy Penguins uh, with the thought of uh, creating Web3's first ever legacy IP brand and uh, distributing blockchain technology to uh, as many people as we can. And so uh, happy to be here and uh, my good friend Linus will take it from here. Thanks, Luca. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I am a little older than Luca. Um, I'm Linus. Um, I've been working in the high growth uh, tech space for almost 20 years now, um, working at uh, some amazing companies like, uh, you know, that you might know in the Web2 space, like LinkedIn, Pinterest, and Tesla. Um, and then personally got into crypto for the last seven years. Uh, first start off, you know, talking about Bitcoin and prices in the bull run. It was a lot of fun just like buying and seeing the number go up. But it wasn't until the, the crash of 2018 that I really started going deep into the tech and realized, hey, there's something here. Um, there's something that we can build and we can kind of make the financial system, even the Internet uh, kind of better. Um, and so that's when I decided I wanted to go all in on it, uh, professionally as well. So I joined Coinbase in the middle of crypto winter in 2018. I stayed for about four years, uh, ended up, uh, being my last role was a, a director of product there. But over the time I had touched a lot of things, uh, fraud, uh, payments, uh, led global growth and international expansion for them and a number of their high growth products, like the Coinbase card and Coinbase earn. Um, and then just kept going, kept going deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole. Uh, after Coinbase, I went to um, a Web3 startup called Origin Protocol, where we built uh, DeFi and NFT products uh, in the ETH ecosystem. And for the last six months, um, you know, I just fell in love with NFTs. And so I've been leading product and design at uh, Magic Eden. Um, and it's been a wonderful time. The builders are still here. The energy is great. Uh, and I'm happy to chat with y'all. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. As you guys could see, obviously both of them have extensive experience before jumping into Web3. So I think um, we'll, we'll hear a lot of these different perspectives uh, on today's chat. So let's start with our first question. This is the question, I would say probably our most popular question uh, amongst the builders in the program. And so that is, what are the biggest product mistakes that you guys see in Web3 builders? Um, Luca, would you mind kicking us off? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think... Uh... You know, I, I actually don't think there's a, it is the, I might give you an interesting answer. I think the mistakes up until this point have not necessarily been product, the, the actual product themselves, but how the products are framed. Uh, I, I believe there's an abundance of technical talent in the space. Uh, a bunch of people uh, probably listening to this that are is a lot smarter than me. Uh, but I think the problem up until this point has been the framing, the branding and the marketing has been atrocious. Uh, blockchain and and tech, uh, you know, blockchain and, and crypto has always been the hook and the value proposition for 99% or call it 95% of products in the industry. That is the value proposition. When in reality, the technology is the back end. It's what powers this stuff. Uh, and it's not why it, it, and you'll find that if you create the, the value proposition is crypto that you fall in line with that cycle of uh, huge rises and huge falls. And it's just honestly not sustainable. And so I'm not probably the best person to speak on product or product integrity from a technical standpoint. Uh, but I can tell you from a marketing and a narrative perspective, uh, that I think has been the biggest mistake uh, from a majority of builders up until this point has been uh, this uh, inappropriate framing of their product um, that is just catered, I guess, to uh, a few subset of power users. So uh, that would be my answer. Nice. Um, 
Yeah. So for me, I think one of the most common mistakes that I see, uh, and I've built, made this mistake a number of times in products I've built, uh, especially, and this is particularly for Web3, is building for a market that's just too early, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of idealists and long-term thinkers here in Web3. Uh, and I really, really, that's just inspirational to me that they think that, hey, we're going to change the financial system. Wouldn't it be great if everything was digitized? Um, and they build for that sort of like 10 year future and realize that, you know, we're still building infrastructure. We're still working out the kinks of, uh, the user experience and they're, they're missing kind of like what the market is today. And what you've got here is, um, you know, it's a small handful of, of users that are incredibly, incredibly passionate that will go to bat for you, that will go deep on your technology, that will, um, evangelize you if you build for them. Uh, and then you earn the right then to uh, go out and move out the concentric circles. Um, and so I see, you know, startups, uh, particularly when cash is king and uh, sort of survival through the through the next cycle is always, always important, right? Um, it's important to just kind of like understand, hey, we want to go somewhere in the next 20 years, uh, but building for today is really, really important. So I kind of want to like dovetail that question because, you know, I think obviously Luca with Pudgy, like I would arguably you guys are the most successful brand in expanding out to the normies and web two users of the world. So like, you know, another common question we get is, you know, at the earliest stage, should you focus on that niche audience and expand concentrically kind of as, as Linus mentioned. Um, but obviously what you guys are doing with Pudgy is expanding fairly quickly. So we'll love to kind of hear your thought process on how you're approaching that focusing uh, on a small audience or, or expanding uh, broadly. Yeah, I mean, it, it all starts, you know, I kind of look at, uh, you know, building a brand or building community as a fire. And uh, it's probably a common analogy, but you have an ember and then you have a little bit of a campfire and then ultimately you want to create a forest fire. And so you, you have to target a, a certain sub segment of people that are already aligned, that already have interests, that... Uh, believe in the messaging and the ethos of what you're trying to create. Now, the interesting part about NFTs is you expedite the ember to campfire process. And that's why I'm actually a firm believer that NFTs are going to be the future of building brands and kind of why we want to why we decided to buy Pudgy Penguins, because we wanted to pursue this case study, which is I actually think it's uh, an accelerant, the ultimate accelerant or the ultimate deterrent to brand building. And so what the NFT does, it creates this aligned incentive where the hardest part of building a brand is probably that first couple thousand people. You automatically have those first, you know, champions and those first, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, beacons of your product. Uh, and so it's, it's, you know, tr traditionally the, 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 the correct answer is yes, you always start small and then you build upwards. With NFT, you almost you you almost remove the zero to one spot, and this might actually spark an interesting thought for the builders out there in the room. I actually believe, and Mad Lads, you've noticed, does this really well, where you can actually take this, have a core set of products. It's actually the smartest way to find product market fit. Uh, and to like save yourself millions of dollars in marketing and, you know, cause probably CACs and crypto, I can't even imagine, you know, I don't do direct, you know, pay to play in crypto, but it's probably 50, a hundred, $200 a user. Well, you can just mint a PFP, give it to them for free, you know, make sure the art is good. Everybody champions this narrative and then champions your products. Uh, and then you can pretty much accelerate product market fit because the, the first couple thousand people are almost, that's how most businesses fail. It's almost impossible to find. So in this sense, you know, we bought into a project. I already had that base. So it was my natural tune was, okay, once you have that base, then you go outwards. The problem is, is people will create that base and then still look inwards. And then that is like the, the, the downfall. So you have to have a good finger on the pulse and understand, okay, base has been created. And then now I go outwards because... I think too many people try to solve churn in crypto when churn is just natural. What you need is just more users coming in than users falling out because users will fall out. They're just not going to stay. Too much opportunity cost, too much FOMO. It's actually like churn is an irrelevant thing to solve for. What you need to solve for is more people coming in versus the people that just will automatically fall out and FOMO and go, you know, pivot capital somewhere else. So, you know, from my perspective, um, Yes, you start small and then you obviously gradually grow big. The NFT fortunately accelerates this really nitty gritty, you know, couple thousand user based process that's really hard for people to find. So when I immediately jumped into the Pudgy Penguin ship, 
I had that base, I had a campfire. And so what I needed to do was, you know, create accelerants to turn that campfire into a forest fire, which to me defined working outwards. And it also depends. Market conditions are a huge variable. In a bear market, I have no interest in circle jerking, you know, 100 or 200 power users. In a bull market, maybe you, you will probably see this shift with me a little bit. Uh, you know, obviously the evergreen side of the company, the IP, the content, that will machine go. But I, I you know, you also, as more people are coming in, you also kind of want to pay attention to this maybe growing inwards user base. And so it, it, it might sound a little complicated, but I think a huge answer to it is like finger on the pulse, ebbs and flows, understanding, you know, where you need to be present, where you don't need to be. Uh, but to answer, answer your question simply, uh, you 100% have to start small to go expect and try to get 10,000 people off the jump. Uh, that's not going to work. Uh, but start with 100, go to 500, go to 1,000. Once you have a base of, I think, a couple thousand people, uh, make sure the expectation is aligned and then just go tell them why you going, why when you go outwards, it's really important that you do that and uh, use the use the PFP meta as a cheat code uh, to find product market fit. If you have a, a DEX or a, a SaaS or some sort of tooling, you'd be surprised. But I actually think that's one of the hidden cheat codes uh, for builders uh, trying to, uh, you know, get free exposure and marketing in the space. Oh man. Yeah. We, we just had mad lads, mad lads, Tr Tristan on the last session. I wish he was here to kind of to, to jam with you, but yeah, so many great nuggets, you know, your first 500,000 users. I, I want to like dig in a little bit more. Uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of NFT projects out there that, that aspire to be brands. Um, but really like, you know, you guys have actually done it. Right. So Curious to hear like what your thought process was. You kind of alluded to it earlier, but like maybe what's something different that maybe you guys did and what has brought you guys success? Whereas there's so many other projects that aspire to, but frankly are, are, are not there yet. Well, the problem up in, with this space, and I don't mean to sound arrogant when I say this, I say this really in the most humble way possible, because I, I promise you there's a slew of things I'm really poorly bad at. I, I'm really not good at, uh, but the 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 word brand was a keyword to hype people and to entice people on a future vision. The problem is nobody actually knew how to build a brand, right? And so, you know, I I live in I, I found success. My life has been changed off of building brands. So I come with a little bit of a unique advantage because if if brand is the narrative, you know, what does it mean to build brand? You know, brand is content, brand is product, brand is partnerships, uh, brand is product integrity, brand is community. Uh, these are things I think we just naturally do well. And we've been doing well for many years, long before Pudgy Penguins. Uh, you know, what, what, what I think it ultimately comes down to though, uh, is uh, a, a lack of complacency or a lack thereof uh, is, is I think, a huge backbone to this. You know, we put two and a half million dollars on the line here. There was no failing. And so even if we, there was a lot of things we didn't know how to do, we figured them out and we made them work because there really was no other option. And so there's something to think about that you can maybe extract a couple of things out of, out of this is, uh, you know, if you have the ability to feel comfortable, don't do it. You kind of want to put your, leave your, leave you and your team in a state of uncomfortableness, uh, Comfortable list leads to complacency and complacency leads to failure. And, uh, uh, and I think that's ultimately where we ended up winning. I think everybody could, you, you could chat GBT how to build a brand and you probably would get a spit, it would spit out the same things that I would probably tell you how to do. I think the difference is, is who was hungrier. Uh, and I think we just had action items and uh, we were uncomfortable and we wanted to win. So, uh, but uh, I think there's plenty of IPs in the space that warrant, uh, you know, huge uh, brand building potential and huge brand potential. I think it's just a matter of uh, if the founders want it uh, bad enough or not. Love that. That's going to make for a great clip. <laughs> um, yeah, if we could maybe shift gears to Linus. So Linus, you have a very, very deep uh, background in, you know, Web2, Big Tech before Web3. Can you maybe talk us through some of the similarities and differences that you're seeing in building in Web2 versus building in Web3? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so at you know, the core level, the similarities of building product are very, very same, very, very similar, right? So, you know, understanding your customer base, customer base, building a core product, thinking about like that, that eternal search for a product market fit. And once you get it, just trying to, trying to capture lightning in a bottle, then pouring on top, uh, grow tactics, you know, thinking about the funnel acquisition, activation, engagement, retention, all of that really, really does still resonate from web two to web three. 
Uh, some of the key differences, though, I love what Luca said about, you know, the the true super fans, right? Web3 can actually accelerate that process of finding your true super fans and going deep. And that's the kind of, you know, community engagement and kind of like user insights and user love that you can't, you know, it's really hard to buy in Web Web 2, but it comes almost for free if you, you know, if you think about it right in Web Web 3, right? And like that kind of user research, right? Like, Web two, you typically have a user research firm. You you pay people to take surveys, but in Web three, they'll tell you. They'll tell you if they love something. They'll tell you if they hate something. And that's something that you really, really need to embrace. Um, a couple other differences: uh, growth comes at you way faster in Web three sometimes, right? If you're lucky, right? You add a monetary incentive on top of something, and you will grow super fast. And that comes with uh, downfalls, right? It can sometimes mask whether or not you have product market fit. So you really have to take a, to a hard look in the mirror of like, hey, is this because of some token pumping or some Ponzi-nomics that I or the, the ecosystem introduced? Or is this true product market fit? And sometimes the answer is not clear, right? Um, the other thing I'll say is barriers to entry are much lower in Web3, right? So if you're a protocol or you're a dApp, you could get copied, you could get forked. Right, another competitor could take your exact same product and add a token on top of it, and all of a sudden, um, your your users they're not locked in. That's the beauty of why I love Web three in terms of like the user choice that you're not your data is not locked in. You're not locked into a particular app that you can go where you choose. But that is dangerous as a builder, right? So what does that mean? You you really have to dig deep and think about sustainability, right? So for a marketplace or an exchange, maybe it's about really thinking about how do you create sustainable liquidity, right? For an app, maybe it's innovation at the user experience layer, right? Um, or if you do have a token, thinking really hard and deep about sustainable tokenomics, right? Not thinking about just a pump in the bull market, but thinking about how can you actually create a system where people are incentivized to really stay, stay with you for the long term and, and get those believers, right? And I think I like what, what Luca said about um, just being comfortable with churn, right? There's a lot of folks that are very um, short-term focused, right? Looking for that next airdrop, looking for the next pump and dump. And some of that you'll have to just sort of embrace and just know that that's part of the process. And um, people selling out, people kind of leaving your ecosystem, that might be goodness in some ways, right? Um, you know, of getting rid of the short term, uh, short term paper hands and like really, really allowing for long term believers to enter your ecosystem. Um, the last thing I'll say is community. Community is an incredibly powerful tool that exists in Web3 in such a big way. And I think that people just pay lip service to it in Web2, right? In Web2, a traditional DAP or a traditional app, it's really just like, here are your customers, right? Here are your users, right? I don't see uh, your run of the mill app in Web2 have the same level of passionate, passionate people in their community as say pudgy penguins or any other kind of like a uh, big web3 brand that is such such an amazing tool that only only happens in web3 if you do it right and so really really embracing that embracing that challenge of like thinking about your users as actually part of your community is just something that i think is such so unique about web3 yeah i mean i think ultimately that's probably one of web3's biggest superpowers oh luca go ahead no no, no i didn't say anything Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, Linus, you know, obviously your, your background, you know, you've, you've led growth for some iconic brands um, and you kind of touched on it earlier, kind of like that balance between product and growth and you don't want to get too crazy with the Pontinomics. So um, maybe can you one, I think two part question. One is, can you talk us through how builders should think about product versus growth as should they think of them as separate things or as an integrate, integrated strategy. And then also too, like how do you balance those two things? So as you kind of alluded to, you don't want to go overboard on the pontinomics, but you also want to keep in mind the benefits of Web3, right? So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, ideally they're highly, highly integrated. Um, you know, the traditional playbook in Web2 would probably be, uh, you know, start small, go, go, you know, do things that aren't scalable, right? Find, you know, manually find your first couple of users and talk to them, right? Um, and wait for product market fit. It's sort of like, would you, um, would you pay for, you know, a Super Bowl ad or Facebook advertising or app store advertising, uh, when you have a leaky bucket, right? Your traditional, uh, kind of playbook would say, no, be really, really careful about that. Otherwise you're wasting money, right? What is, um, 
what is difficult in Web3 is often people are like, oh, I'll just launch a token. They think it's actually free money. So it's important to actually think, no, you're actually paying this money, right? It's, it's as if you are paying out of your balance sheet uh, for advertising when you give out tokens, right? Um, and so resist the temptation sometimes to just go out strong out of the gate with uh, kind of these Ponzi tokenomics that will really, really pump up your metrics um, because that starts the clock. That starts the clock really, really quickly to go figure something out, right? And every time when you see a kind of a price chart, whether it's even an NFT collection or whether it's a, a token price, uh, great for the early holders to see kind of like token price go up, but on the other side of every transaction is a buyer, right? And so when you when you see some floor price go up uh, significantly or some token price go go up significantly, there's a buyer on the other end that now expects that much value, right? And so when you think about it that way, um, you might be more careful about manufacturing uh, some of these really really sharp pumps because what it does create is people in your community, holders in your community that now have this expectation that that is debt that you might have to pay for in the future, right? Now, of course, a lot of this is not into your control, right? But it would it's it's certainly just something to think about when it comes to how much do you want to bake the token or the monetary incentive front and center for why people be interested in this app, right? Uh, in my view, I think that that should be something accelerate, accelerating what is already working, right? And so if somebody is already feeling the value, the core value of your app or uh, being part of your community or that entire experience and a sort of token incentive uh, is actually fuel to that fire and there's sort of incentive for people to keep holding, that's kind of the holy grail. And very few people have, have figured it out, but there are some that stand out in my mind um, uh, that have created some uh, lasting community for for folks uh, alongside the app uh, with their with their incentives. So um, all that to say, it's really hard. Life comes at you fast in Web3, um, but it is an amazing thing to get right. And it's, it's, I think it's the future of uh, kind of uh, financial ecosystems to right, really think about an integrated approach to uh, apps plus uh, kind of tokens. I think you framed it great, like perfectly, right? Uh, you know, it's an accelerant to, to something that's already working, um, kind of reframing the token in that sense. I know, Luca, you've kind of talked about in the past that like, you know, mints and tokens are almost like a liability for, for the founders and builders. Um, uh, curious if you could kind of uh, dig into that a little bit more. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting statement. Uh, you know, when I first got into this business, one of the community members said, your job is to not create liabilities and uh, in layman's terms, not to create future problems. And uh, if you have, and it, and it depends what your product is. I think on one side of it, you know, Linus hit it right on the head. It's an accelerant to what's already existing. And so it can be a huge net positive. Uh, but sometimes, and I think this is like kind of the problem with the space, if, to be frank, is like, you'll just do a token and it, there's no need for one, right? You, you can't figure out some sort of B2B or enterprise SaaS model, which could be just as lucrative. And then you just create this huge overhanging liability that if you got to understand on there's there's two sides of the coin on one side you know your coin is like an ipo for the business and the community and it's like great right but the second it's down 90 percent or 99 percent, you've killed your business with it i don't think there's a, i don't think and maybe linus would know better than i but i don't think there's an example of a token down 99 percent in which the product still lived and still retained customers and people still used it you've automatically just put yourself into the dungeon and it's not necessary but like there's this culture here that if you're building a crypto product i mean and after a couple of years you don't have a token you are doing you know everyone a disservice your community your investors and that i think that's that's that sucks you know, like that ultimately is it's an Achilles heel to this because there's only so much, you know, concentrated liquidity and there's only almost so much room to actually have a successful token. It's not easy. And uh, especially because I think there's a slew of things that come with it with storytelling and narrative and branding and marketing. And you know, sometimes it's not even about the tech and it's not even about the product. So you might be an awesome product builder with amazing tech and amazing infrastructure. But to be frank, if you don't, if you can't tell a story, if you don't know how to market and, you know, you know, lean into a narrative, I mean, boom, then, and then the tokens down 99% because of it, your product now then sucks, whether it sucks or not, it just sucks in the eyes of the consumer. And then you've just killed, you've killed the whole thing. 
And, and this is, I think, the stigma and the culture that I, I would hope to try to reinvent in some shape, way, or form in my own little niche within this crypto universe. Obviously, there's many niches within this ecosystem that uh, you know I probably will have no influence over. Uh, but uh, it's an important thing to think about because just as much as it might be at a huge, exciting moment, also think about team morale, right? Like a token is like the light at the end of the tunnel. Token down 99%. I can't even imagine what that would feel like. Guys got option packages pegged to that. That's supposed to be the grand moment. You did it too early. You did it haphazardly because you maybe wanted to get in front of a bull or, or because somebody told you to do it. And all of a sudden, communities checked out. I mean, you, Linus also hit this right on the head. You see it time and time again. Once token does its thing, community then go migrates to the next one, right? And then it wasn't really a community. Either, you know, it wasn't really a community in the first place. The best thing that you can do is not even allude to that type of stuff. Build a real culture. Whether you know, I rather have ten people who really care about what I'm building than a thousand people who are interested in the free money that I'm going to give them any day of the week. Right. And so it's this interesting paradigm uh, that ultimately I, I, I'm a firm believer the industry has to get over to really find success, because every time you're building crypto tech, like if if it is culture to then go launch a token one to three years later, like if that is the roadmap, it's going to be such a shitty ride regardless of price pumps and dumps, it's just going to be, it's just not going to really stick, I think, the way we all want it to stick. So that's my two cents. But again, I'm probably not the best person to speak on it. And I thought Linus, uh, it, uh, you know, translated it really well. Well, I, I, I liked your point about, you know, it's, there's two sides of the coin, right? It, it is like a double-edged sword, right? It can, it can help or hurt you. And I think what's obvious about you two is that you guys are obviously very long-term oriented thinkers, right? So you're not just going after uh, the super short-term minded tactics, um, to double click a little bit on what you said earlier, Luca, you know, you kind of mentioned that things about, uh, sometimes it is about the marketing and the narrative more so than the product at times. Um, and so, you know, not everyone has the background you have as, you know, previous CMO and whatnot. So maybe for some of the builders that don't have that marketing and branding background, are there any kind of like tactics or, or, uh, frameworks uh, that you would, uh, advise them? Yeah, no, this is it's a, it's a great question. Probably where I'll serve you guys the best. And and this might be vague, but if you critically think on it long enough, you'll really get what I'm saying. It was a it was a breakthrough for me. It honestly changed this business uh, for for many many months. Uh, Pudgy Peng was actually wasn't really doing well the first time we bought it. Uh, but one, you control the narrative and you create the narrative. There, you know, you are living in the NFT world. You're living in my world. Uh, and, and you can't tell me otherwise. You can't pull up anything that will, you know, you, you might think you can contradict or or debunk what I'm saying, but I control the narrative. And, and controlling narratives in this industry, if you do it well enough, can create billions and billions and billions of dollars of value. Um, the Also, a, a expectation alignment around that narrative and then making sure what you're doing is supporting that. So this, this is, you know, I'm not going to give you guys some uh, weird pay to play strategy on how to get, you know, uh, CACs for half a cent uh, and, and, you know, tons of impressions is actually irrelevant. Uh, the space is so driven by word of mouth and these little silos of group chats that really what you need to do is you need to build credibility and trust and then champion that. Like one thing that I, I think we do really well from a marketing perspective is I'm pretty polarizing, right? And I will say things. But the crazy thing about us is I will talk the talk, but we also walk the walk. And I think that that combination of the two is unbelievably powerful if you can keep up a really consistent cadence of this. For example, if I'm building, you know, call it a layer one, and I'm saying, you know, we are going to be the best layer one in the world, and we are going to be the 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 layer one for consumers, right? And then all of a sudden, I do a partnership with again, this is like very top of the mind, but a partnership with Starbucks. Okay, that supports my narrative. Next, you know, our transactions are cheaper and faster than the rest. Okay, then that supports my narrative. And then, and then, and then these are just two obvious things, but then you compound it 10, 15, 20 times. All of a sudden, your community members, you know, you're the, the marketing heat, marketing in Web3 and crypto to me is whose word holds the most weight. 
right? Like th that's how I would define it. And how do you create weight around your word? It's through expectation and then supporting that expectation with outputs. And then, but like being vocal about it, you know, one thing that I did when I came into the space and it was really, it was like my Achilles heel was I actually don't like talking about things. I like just doing it. But you, 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 you know, one thing that I found is if you're, if you don't have a champion in your team and in your ecosystem, you are already like three steps behind. Uh, uh, and this is not only just for crypto, there, you know, an easy metric. I actually was a pretty big stock trader uh, years ago, but I did this like research thing, you know, CEOs with the most followers on Twitter, right? Compared to CEOs of their competitors, they had significantly higher market caps than, than the competitors and the CEOs who didn't, right? Elon Musk is like the perfect example of it, right? Like obviously Tesla spends no money on marketing. They don't need to, they have Elon, right? But there's actually a direct correlation be behind like the, the influence of the founder or members of the team and what they can do, right? And, and you know, these are, I think, cheat codes in the space uh, that like, again, you know, we, we bought this, we had no money in the bank account, right? Like we worked for free for 12 months and then we were able to raise $9 million, but that's nothing compared to the competitors that, you know, that, you know, are, that we're competing with, at least in the NFT space. Why were we able to find the success that we were able to do is because I was able to align an expectation, galvanize a message, community then also galvanized that message. And then every time we had an announcement and something that uh, we did towards that, you know, message, it then supported it. And so all of a sudden you do that 20 times, you have so much weight on your word that then you, then you create leverage, right? You're in the business of creating leverage. Then I'm, you know, then I have all of CT talking about, you know, what Pudgy Penguins is doing. And then I can go and make partnerships that otherwise I could have never even dreamed of. And then leverage becomes in your favor and then you use it to your advantage. But, you know, marketing and web three or, or crypto to me is really off of the basis of word of mouth. And so how does word of mouth really catch on to the forest fire? I think it starts with just the weight of the person's word, whether it's the founder or a member of the founding team. Um, and so sorry for the monologue, but hopefully that gives a, a little bit of context. And then here's a here's an easy one. Gifts. I can't even tell you. I didn't know this before this. Uh, you know, Pudgy Penguins gets about 60 to 70 million views a day on Giphy. You, this might not seem like much, but I'm actually indexing for some of the biggest words in the industry on GIF i.e. if you type in certain words, uh, you know, I'll let you discover it on your own. I, I control mind share. This goes back to the PFP meta, right? PFP culture around your product. Maybe there's like a gift network. What you really want to do is you really just want to create touch points that, again, support your thesis and what you're saying. Uh, but Giphy is probably the most untapped and, it, and it's not expensive. Uh, and anybody on a reason with a reasonable marketing budget could pull it off. I, I love that hack. It's like the new SEO for for memes, almost, right? <laughs> uh, let, let's let's maybe shift gears a bit to, to Linus. You know, kind of, um, you know, a common question a lot of builders have, obviously, is is pivoting, right? And you know, I remember the last time we talked. You know, there's a whole zero royalty debate, and there's just like obviously a lot of projects had to pivot or die uh, at that time. So. Um, you know, do you have any advice for builders when they're kind of facing a situation like pivoting? Yeah. Um, well, since you mentioned zero royalties, first, I, I want to address what's what has happened and what's happened to kind of creators with uh, marketplaces kind of kind of going to optional or zero royalties sucks. Right. And, um, you know, I'm proud to say that uh, Magic Eden uh, before before my time. Uh, worked really, really hard with the Solana ecosystem, uh, a bunch of builders there uh, when kind of that was that whole whole thing was happening in the Solana ecosystem that uh, they actually solved uh, creator royalties at the protocol level. Um, and so that's something that I personally stand for. And it's one thing that like Magic Eden really stands for of like empowering creators. Uh, and so we just announced a partnership uh, about a month ago with Yuga Labs, where we're building an Ethereum marketplace that will honor creator royalties at the smart contract level. Um, so working really hard on that, so more to come soon there. Um, but you know, uh, your original question was really around pivots and um, a couple of things. Um, you know, this is something that uh, I faced uh, internally within a large company as well, when we were incubating zero to one projects, as well as kind of a startups where, 
you know, literally we, we had a product or, you know, a less than a handful of products and they just weren't working. And so we were kind of looking at each other of like, how do we actually face the situation? So kind of a high level framework and an exercise that, you know, we, we did, um, it comes from the spirit of like, how do you, how do you be wrong as fast as possible and uh, in the least costly way? Right. And so you would, uh, basically take a really, really hard look at what you're building, uh, or your company, or how you're positioned, and list out the riskiest assumptions. Like, what are the things that you believe? Just just write them all down, just do a brainstorm, just brain dump it, and then rank them from that is the riskiest thing. Um, and so have an honest conversation about all these assumptions and say, one, how likely are we wrong about this assumption, right? And then secondly, how fucked are we if we are wrong? Right. And so like you might say if you're an NFT project that like, OK, we have this assumption that creator royalties are just going to be this ongoing thing at these marketplace are just going to honor them out of the goodness of their hearts. And how after you if you're wrong. Right. And so you can actually basically just just be honest with yourself. of Like, OK, how how do you think marketplace is going to react when comp competition um, kind of picks up? And then how screwed are you if you're wrong? And, you know. Uh, hat tip to Luca and the Pudgy Penguins team, they were already thinking a couple steps ahead. Of course, creator royalties were something that uh, was good for the project. But I remember talking to Luca and he's spoken very, very uh, publicly about this of like, hey, if you're still relying on creator royalties at this point in the game, then you've, you've missed something, right? And so that is something that you build resilience as a team to say if the ecosystem or the ground shakes from under you, that you're thinking about plans, uh, alternative plans, and you're planning ahead for that. And so I think that that was a really, really important exercise for us. And also, you know, for a lot of Web3 uh, startups that are bootstrapped or crowdfunded or things like that, um, you don't have the traditional accountability that you might have in a Web2 startup where you've raised funding, you've gotten uh, a board of directors. So I think it's actually important that, that discipline, that first of all, that freedom is really nice in Web3, but like you can actually get lazy intellectually as well. So it's really important to actually have some sort of mechanisms internally for checks and balances to say that if you're building something that's actually risky, like give yourself some, you know, like fund it internally, right? Let's say you've got, you know, uh, I don't know, $10 million in funding, but you are working on something risky, like limit your budget to say, actually, no, I'm only giving you half a million in seed funding to basically prove this out. And like, what are the, what are the milestones you want to see before you actually refund it? Right. And so um, those are the kinds of things that you don't, you know, uh, startups that are uh, a little more loose don't actually think about, but like that tight discipline and like waking up every morning and grinding and figuring out how can I prove myself wrong on this assumption um, has actually been really, really helpful for me to get sort of this, uh, the honesty of like, nope, it's time to pivot. This, this just ain't working. That, that, that's great. That's great advice. I, I love the framing on, you know, <laughs> how screwed are we? Um, Maybe let's take this to Luca, it kind of a similar question, um, but maybe framed a little bit differently. So, you know, you've talked about staying true to your North Star, right? And so as we know in the NFT space, it's obviously highly narrative driven. There's lots of potential distractions, but at the same time, you still want to be adaptable as a founder, right? I'm seeing that as some of the questions in the Q&A. So um, do you have any advice for, for founders on how can you stay adaptable and keeping up with the trends and narratives, but also staying true to your North Star? Yeah, one of the, the, the what you got one of the things that Yuga actually did best is actually they were able to catch trends. If you actually notice, if you really yeah. peel back their roadmap, a lot of the things that they did, they actually weren't the ones that created it. Like serums was kind of a thing before they did the mutants. They just were so big that they controlled the narrative, right? It then became theirs. Uh, this is interesting because look, and I'll, I'll give you like an example, uh, you know, our North Star at Pudgy Penguins is to distribute blockchain to millions of people and to give or create a brand that tens of millions of hopefully hundreds of millions of people know and love, right? So every day, whether I make an announcement this month or not, our Instagram will grow 100,000, maybe 200,000 followers, our Giphy will get another billion or 2 billion views, you know, our socials will grow, we'll sell 100,000 or 200,000 toys that month. And, you know, and all of those things support what I just told you, right? But you know, maybe there's a maybe there's a bull market and there's an ordinals trend, right? And and we we decided not to do it this way because it was a bear market. It wasn't a bull market, but you know, maybe there's a, an ordinals trend, right? Well, 
you know, I, 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 again, North Star is on board, you know, millions of people and I can catch the trend by onboarding Bitcoin native people, uh, whether it's a hundred or a thousand and maybe doing some sort of subordinate collection there. Now I'm a huge believer in supply and demand. And so this is a poor example, but just one that I'm going to give you anyway, uh, versus me then like where, where you can't pivot, right. Is, is all of a sudden social is a thing. And now Pudgy Penguins is like, okay, we're going to go make a social fly platform. Well, like, how does that actually like tie into the entire ecosystem of creating a brand that tens of millions of people know and love? Like, maybe I can go to Ordinals and catch a trend here and I can be nimble or maybe an AVAX NFT. And, and maybe I can add ecosystem and characters to the universe. But what I'm not going to start doing is I'm not going to start building, you know, enterprise SaaS uh, for some reason, right? Or, or go and start uh, like... That I think is the difference. Now, one thing that I think we did really well, and again, it's it's all about expectations here. Like when you're talking about managing your community, it starts and stops with expectations. So, you know, being able to, you know, go to them and say, you know, hey, this is our North Star. This is how we're supporting it. Uh, and then also you'd be kind of being like vague in the positioning. Like one thing I think we did really well in Pudgy Penguins, we label ourselves an IP company, right? So an IP company, I can go make a game. I can make toys. I can make content. I can do a lot of things, but it all supports the idea of this IP being known and loved by tens of millions of people, right? It all supports that. Now the toys could start failing or the game might not work. All of those things are fine, but you know, all, what we're trying to do is create products and experiences that hopefully make the penguin the most popular penguin in the world. What you then don't want to go do is just pivot completely off course. So this is actually a really th good thing that you brought it up because what you do want to do, especially in crypto, is if you lose the narrative and you lose the plot or you lose attention, you might you, you might as well have lost. Now, one of the most important things that I read on Twitter maybe 12 months ago was somebody named Andrew tweeted. He said, the definition of a blue chip is somebody who can gain attention, lose attention, and gain it again. And that was really impactful to me. And that's actually what I ended up optimizing for was, can I go on a hiatus for three months? And then can I get people talking about me with a snap of a finger? I've been able to do it now seven or eight times that I know unequivocally I could go zero dark 30 for six months and then come back and then have the whole entire timeline speaking about us again. Uh, and, and that I think is really important from a from a, a, you want to be able to figure out how to crack that code and how you crack that code is being able to catch trends, right? Like it is such a trend driven market. It's actually pretty fascinating. L1s are what's hot and then it's L2s and then it's something else and then it's something else. Uh, so you want to be nimble and you actually want to be able to catch those trends. It's just, are you catching those trends and confusing your audience or can you justify how this fits into the narrative? If you can justify how it fits into the narrative and the community is aligned, right? Obviously, one thing I think we do really well is we talk to them about like, we, we have a debate, right? I don't just assume it falls into the narrative because I dictate that it does. You know, we have a conversation, we agree, and then we execute. And so uh, you want to be nimble. You want to catch trends because that's going to keep you top of mind. But you don't want to go completely 360 in the other direction and then uh, confuse everybody in your community. The one thing you want to avoid at all costs is confusion. Confusion is like the beginning of the death spiral. And uh, as long as you can avoid that, you'll be fine. I want to dig in a little bit. You talk about, you know, you know, talking the talk, but also walking the walk, obviously, and that helps you manage expectations and, you know, kind of being out there and, and, um, and sharing your message and sharing your narrative. How much of your narrative is you kind of speaking it into existence um, versus reacting to um, the market information coming in? I'm naturally a speaker. Uh, I, I naturally just speak things into existence. So I guess that's my personality type. So internally, we, you know, we are in that mindset of we 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 talk it, we're going to do it. Uh, but but again, it it, it you, you a lot of people manifest things or or talk things, right? It's it's a matter of like, can you actually concretely support that? So for example, I've been preaching for a long time that we are going to be the face of NFTs and we're going to be the face of Web3. That's That's been my thing for pretty much 18 months. And that we are going to build a legacy IP brand that tens of millions of people know and love. It can take you five minutes through scrolling through the Pudgy Penguins Twitter to come to that conclusion that I'm probably doing that. 
or I'm one of two people doing it. There's really no other competition with outside of maybe board apes, right? It's, it's us and board apes. So, you know, that's the key, right? Now, I wasn't saying this 12 months ago, right? Because I humbly was not, right? We were not achieving that, right? But if you just look at the magnitude of what we're building, if you look at the impressions, if you look at the engagement, if you look at just the sales of like actually what's transpiring here, it we are we are fulfilling that goal, right? And every day we move towards that goal. And you can see that just through social blade, just scroll through our socials. That's the perfect indications to us growing into that direction. And so I, I think it's, you know, it's a matter of that, in my opinion. And, uh, and yeah. Love that. Um, cool. So we got a bunch of questions. So uh, I do want to leave time for that. So why don't we jump into that? Um, let's start with uh, Abitej. Uh, I apologize if I butchered your name. Uh, Abitej's question about using NFTs as a proponent of brand identity. So uh, Abitej, you want to come on and, and ask your question? Yeah, th thank you for uh, the opportunity. Um, uh, hey, Luca, to your point, which was a great point of bringing Mad Lads, which is non-PFP project, so it sort of is like a face to a lot of suit of products, which they're using NFTs as a social layer. So now we are in a hyper um, financialization of multiple things. And also is with Web3, it sort of is like this hyper community driven narrative there where community drives everything. Now, would you what would you recommend to a non-NFT project such as a DeFi protocol, whether to create their own NFT collection and sort of like create a community around it or rewarding mechanism around it or leverage an existing NFT community such as like Pudgy Penguins or Board Apes? Um, what would be your recommendation and how do you balance that? It, it, it depends on what your skill set is, I think, and, and just understanding who's a part of your team. Now, I love that you brought this up because actually integrating with other NFT projects is a complete cheat code, right? Like, you know, aligning yourself with, uh, you know, you you actually saw this in the hype of the bull with crypto punks and bored apes. It was almost, it, it's there's something fascinating about, I, I remember... Uh, like being on Twitter and and looking at my DMs. And if it wasn't a CryptoPunk, a Bored Ape or a Pudgy Penguin, I wasn't responding to them. It's like something fascinating about that. Like I had no interest, you know, any other. Uh, so the, there, there's, there's something to tap into there. I think if you have a good finger, if you think you are a culturally driven company or you have members in your team that understand culture, making your own could be pretty advantageous because it's more tight knit. You control, you, you, you garner more of a voice. Uh, but I think the second best thing, if again, if you're a technically savvy team, nobody's really like hyper social, extroverted, you know, the next best thing is probably tapping into a community that you think uh, has the same ethos and uh, and personalities that you would want in your community uh, and then trying to integrate with them. Now, you'll probably see about 10 to 15 percent of the success doing that than you would if you were to do what Mad Lads did, right? Because Mad Lads is very clear. The PFP is the PFP. They're a wallet company. They're an exchange, right? The PFP is just like, this is the PFP. And, you know, there's some culture and there's some cool stuff around that. But I think they're almost clear that, like, this is just like a PFP. This is, you know, don't expect. The, they have, they've really tapered expectations on that. Uh, and then I remember D Gods was actually kind of doing this too. You know, a perfect example is, you know, D guys did what they did. They created Uteless. I remember talking to Frank. Uteless was making three, four hundred grand a month in reoccurring revenue and SaaS revenue, outsourcing it to other projects who wanted to use the Uteless. What he was actually doing is he was building enterprise software for NFT projects, right? And using the D gods community to show how awesome these products are, and then everybody FOMO'd and wanted to use the same. The best example of that is Uteless. So. You're going to see real traction if you do it yourself. You'll see maybe 10% of the traction if you integrate, but that's a free 10% that you otherwise might not have done without having this conversation or without knowing the bunch. Uh, but also, one is a tremendous lift, uh, depending on how you align expectations. It could not be. I don't know if Bad Lads is a huge lift for the, for the backpack team. I would, I would assume no, because they've set the expectation that it's not anything greater than what you already think it is. 
versus, you know, you going to a pudgy penguins and saying, Hey, I want to integrate. You might find five to 10% of the success, right. But like zero to no lift and probably an hour or two on a BD conversation, a telegram back and forth and then boom. Right. Uh, so I think it's really just a matter of like, you know, bandwidth, team skill sets, culture within your, your executive group or, or the members of your team. And I think that's kind of how I delineate uh, either which way. That's a, that, that's a great tactic and strategy. Love, love that. Um, I think this next question listed, I think this is a good question for Linus because Linus kind of talked about sustainability. So this question from Jonathan uh, about monetization and sustainability. So Jonathan, do you want to come on stage and ask a question? Hi, thank you. Yes. So um, my question was given that NFT volumes, valuations and royalties have decreased, how should projects using NFTs go about thinking about monetization or sustainability models? And also I was thinking about marketplaces, NFT marketplaces that um, like compete on the co commissions. So um, if they have to decrease the commissions, it can be difficult for them. Yeah, uh, great question. Um, I'll take a stab and I, I think uh, Luca will probably have uh, some perspectives here if he wants to chime in. Um, first, uh, I think that the, um, you know, having gone through now a, a full cycle on NFTs, uh, I think if uh, NFT creators should have the expectation that, um, you know, they can't just sustainably rely on building, you know, something huge with with just creator royalties, right? Creator royalties should be something that sustains, uh, you know, just just helps move things along. Um, you know, it's something that we're working hard uh, with the ecosystem to kind of uh, kind of solve that creator royalties are here to stay. Uh, however, that shouldn't be the sole revenue source, right? If you're thinking about kind of building a, a product that really just relies on um, this asset trading hands and uh, you're getting kind of like, uh, you know, something like a five to 7% um, kind of royalty on top of it. And like thinking that that is actually going to sustain multiple employees and kind of building out a sustainable roadmap. I think that there are a number of different examples of uh, folks that should show that, that that's just not going to work, right? Um, and so I think that uh, NFTs are an incredible bootstrap to this community, right? And what you do with that community is is now up to you, right? Um, and so some, some folks have actually raised capital beforehand, and the NFT project is kind of a way to identify your super fans, right? Valhalla uh, is the first one that comes to mind of like, they're building out kind of a Web3 Twitch, they already raised funding, and then they, they go and they build uh, kind of this NFT community. The NFT community is kind of like icing on top to identify your super fans that you can get that feedback and like um, push out products too, but you have to think about uh, a sustainable revenue model. Or what you think about is the NFT is the start of an IP, um, and then you start building out brands with physical products, with digital products, and things like that. And so I think it's, um, you know, the NFT project is not the company anymore. It's kind of like you have to think about why does this company exist? And then NFTs should be kind of a strategy or a channel similar to, oh, I'm building an app. Uh, or I, I have a YouTube channel as a marketing uh, channel. It's it's going to be a core, like it's my belief that NFTs are, are going to be a uh, kind of a core strategy for anybody trying to build a business, but it's not the business itself, right? You have to think about um, the your reason for existing um, that is unique uh, to you. I think that's going to be a great quote, right? It's a core strategy, but not the business itself. Um, so let's let's do maybe like one or two more questions. Uh, Nine, you have a question for Luca about the pudgy pudgy turnaround. Um, feel free to hop on stage and ask your question. All right, <clears throat> thank you, Stephen. Thank you for having me. So I'm just uh, have a quick question for Luca. So I just wanted to know like what surprised you the most going through like the pudgy turnaround journey and also like as extrapolating towards like a broader question like what are the key insights when you engage in the uh, like, a private equity s deal like what what you did with pudgies and what do you see this being more prevalent in other verticals for example in DeFi protocol despite the nature of being open source infra infrastructure and so on and so forth thank you 
Yeah, I think from a private equity standpoint, it's pretty fascinating because I actually think it gives a ton of advantages that you otherwise wouldn't have if you're coming off of the backs of a mint or let's say like a token presale. Uh, the leverage of being able to say that I've given and not taken to the community, I think is a huge part as to why we're here today. And there's something to be said when it comes to like mutually aligned respect, right? Like when Pudgy Penguins is, you know, when Pudgy Penguins has been through its dark times, which it's been almost two years since we've taken it over and it has not been all great. There's a, you just check the floor price chart. You can see where there's moments of turmoil. It's been a roller coaster. Don't get me wrong. But I never got this like attacking that I've seen other communities do to their founders, because I think there's a level of respect where people know that if this fails, I have just as much to lose as the next person. And there's very few people who are in that position in this space that I think gives the whole private equity side of, of acquiring either NFT projects or DeFi protocols or crypto brands a really unique edge. Because what I have tend to find is the hardest part about this business is actually the mental toughness side. It's dealing with anonymous characters who are not showing their face, who have the ability and the courage to tell you things they otherwise would never tell you if they weren't behind some anonymous character figure that is actually really tough on the morale of the founder and the rest of the team. Now, I've experienced little bits of that, but not nearly as much as probably the next person that I've seen or some of my colleagues and peers in the industry, because I think there's just an underlying level of respect knowing that I have just as much to lose, if not more to lose than the next person within the community. And that is actually a really interesting edge that's not to be underestimated, especially if you're thinking from a long-term outlook. Now, if you're trying to pump and like just you know, do the the short term gratification crypto playbook, you know, you're probably better off doing, you know, and not doing that. But if you actually have a really long term horizon and a long term thesis, I think there's very few things that you can do better than actually uh, have some sort of uh, acquisition within your company, whether it's a, you know, to, to just level with the community and the greater space of saying like, hey, you know, we are here and we are serious. And obviously, there's it's very unique to us. And I'm not saying go and try to force an acquisition. Uh, but if you are thinking about it, I think there are core edges and core advantages that I have over somebody who's, you know, starting something from scratch in that respect. Um, some of my key learnings, I think, are um, probably one of the most important things I've learned is to really build these things right. In my opinion, you have to be a founder of the people. And this is not your ship to dictate. You are a custodian of the community. And I think that's what we've done best. And it's not just me. Our whole C-level group really embodies this ethos. We are not here to dictate the vision. We are here to align on it and we're here to execute on it, right? Uh, I, I think that is really, really important. I believe, and, and this is me, and some people may agree or disagree, but this is just my, my opinion on the state of Web3, is you, know, you can sell products on the blockchain and not be a Web3 company. A Web3 company is not defined by the technology you use, but the ethos in which you build. Right, A Web3 company, to me, is defined by your ability to take this group, i.e. your community, with these aligned incentives and basically build this thing together uh, in the best possible way. And so I tell the team that we are the muscle to the hive mind that is the community. Because 5,000 minds, no matter how smart you think you are, just exponentially are going to be exponentially smarter than you, uh, at least from an ideation standpoint. Now, you can't just go take every idea and run with it. You know, we are the filter. I am the filter. A couple of the, my team members are the filter. We are the filter and we extract the best ideas and or the best pieces of feedback and we, we, we improve on it. And it's not just ideas, it's product feedback. I tell the community, don't leave a one-star review. Tell me what's wrong. Uh, be upset about it, but let's go fix it, right? And so uh, these uh, the, the culture in which you build, I think, is super important because people can feel that. People can see that. You could probably get away with being successful, not embodying that type of ethos. But I, I believe as this space matures, that people are going to migrate towards that type of culture above all else. 
and then my my last thing, which is probably super important, is whether you're a token or an NFT project, uh, sentiment is more important than price. I can't tell you. I mean, I, I thought for the longest that from a, from a deliverable standpoint that we were doing everything that the Web3 community and at the Web3 and NFT space wanted us to do. But price did not reflect that. But sentiment was through the roof. You couldn't find a person who said what we were doing was silly outside of, you know, some, some you know, weird person, you know, maybe like there's obviously that 5% that are just never going to support you anyway, which you just got to kind of just ignore and put on mute. Uh, but but sentiment is the most important part. Price will eventually catch up to sentiment. Uh, you know, obviously, Pudgy Penguins has a pretty good run these last two weeks. And people ask, well, why is it running? And, and I ask them, well, why didn't it run before? Right. Is the real question. It's just happening now. But, it, you know, it, that is just sentiment. You know, price catching up to sentiment is kind of how I looked at it because uh, there wasn't anything predicated. There wasn't any big, real big announcement really outside of, you know, our animation and the fact that, you know, we'll probably get into gaming here shortly. But the point of the matter is, is uh, price used to really affect me. I used to think, man, I suck uh, and uh, or I'm not doing well. And then another good idea as to why that doesn't matter as much, at least sentiment is really the key indicator of your success is Alex from Nansen sits on our advisory board. And I was I was venting to him maybe like 14 months ago. I said, dude, I'm doing everything right, it feels like. I'm doing everything they want me to do. And I'm breaking my back doing it. Why is it the case? And he pulled up Nansen and he found that there was two guys with 200 penguins that basically were selling them every time they could. And so where I, where a majority of the community thought I was doing amazing and found success, why that wasn't translating in price was because two dudes were dictating it for three months, right? And so I felt so good about myself. I was like, oh, I'm not a failure. Unique holder. I went on the Nansen da dashboard and I saw unique holders are up. You know, uh, you know, people are buying, people are holding, people are not selling. But but the only two was just these two guys that were just selling it every time it hit three ETH. It was just like a, a it was like an automatic sell. And I was I thought I was doing a terrible job. Uh, so there's more to meets the eye, and I would just say a gauge sentiment above all else. And if you have a really positive sentiment, if people are happy, eventually that will correlate into the price action that you want it to. That that's that's a great one to 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 wrap up on. I know we're a little bit over time, so want to be respectful. Um, any parting thoughts uh, that you guys have for builders, Linus? Would you would you like to start with that? Ah, oh, man, parting thoughts. Um, you know, uh, just keep, keep on moving. You know, I think maybe the, what resonated with, um, with me about what Luca just said is just this quote that I tell myself, uh, investors control the price, builders control the value, right? Um, so don't get too caught up in day-to-day -day prices. I know that's really hard. I'm a guy that checks my phone pretty often, unfortunately, uh, for prices, right? But that's just the sentiment of the day right? Like, um, why is something moving? It's some random financialization thing of some people dumping or sweeping or some short squeeze. If you're looking at traditional financial markets, it doesn't, you know, eventually the price will catch up to the value and that's what you can control. And uh, just thank you guys uh, for having me on this and uh, double down on what Linus just said. And it might sound corny, but don't give up. That's, uh, that's the key denominator. Just keep on building and uh, the beauty about the crypto space is it rewards people who build well and build uh, over the course of a, a, a period of time. So uh, things get rough out there. Just keep your head down and uh, just know that there's light at the end, end of the tunnel. Awesome. Great parting thoughts, guys. Um, again, thank you guys for spending time with us. Um, really very insightful. So, um, yeah, thank you again, guys. And uh, we'll, we'll catch you guys next time. <laughs>